My name is Jake, welcome to the channel. In today's video, I wanna share with you something a little bit different. A couple of months ago, I wrote an article that I was planning on publishing on Seeking Alpha. I never ended up publishing the article and I wanted to go over that article with you today. It's a little bit of a different format, but I think the topic is gonna to be really interesting if you're considering retiring early with dividend investing because I kind of dive into the uh, the weeds when it comes to the numbers and kind of future projections. So if you're into that, like, you know, I use a dividend reinvestment calculator. I'm a big nerd when it comes to that kind of stuff. So I get excited about it. Maybe you do too as well. I, I don't know, but it's a very different format than what I'm used to. And I'd be curious to kind of hear your thoughts in the comments if this is something that I should maybe you know do again or completely avoid because it's boring and nobody watches it. I guess we'll find out because I've never done this before. But yeah, if you're new to the channel, once again, my name is Jake. I reached Barista Fire at the age of 37 last year where I quit my nine to five job. I'm living off of my dividend portfolio portfolio and working part-time on the side. So that's a little bit about me. I'm a little nerdy, a bit of an introvert, quirky sense of humor, all of that good stuff. So if you're new, welcome. And I do want to say, because I am talking about potential future returns, that not everything I'm saying is going to necessarily come true. I'm basing everything off of historical data, which we all know is never a guarantee of future returns. So I want you to remember as watching this video, I want you to take everything that I'm saying with a major grain of salt, because my goal here is to highlight some of the things to focus on, you know, if you're trying to retire early off of dividend investing, because it's easy to make mistakes when you're planning for early retirement with dividend investing. And if you don't focus on what's important, you could really end up getting hurt and it could look a little like this. ¿Cómo llega si llega a tocarle? A ver. ¿De qué manera? Balón, balón. Y el otro estira la pierna ni le toca la pierna. Ni le toca. Venga, va, hombre, da. Oh man, I love it. I love it. All right, cool. So I want to walk you through this. I'm going to read through this, but also add some of my commentary around, you know, the thinking behind why I wrote this article and, and share some things that maybe have helped to you. Um, like I said, if you're planning on retiring early with your dividend portfolio. So the, the title of the article was going to be Dividend Growth Plus Income and Early Retirees Monthly Dividend Dream. And really the focus around this article was around the early retirement dilemma, right? If you're retiring early, maybe in your 30s or 40s, you have a lifetime ahead of you that you still have to live and your portfolio still has to generate you know, a growing dividend. And, but if you're retiring early, you probably don't have a lot of money. So it's kind of finding that, that balance and you really are in this dilemma. Well, how do you find the right mix of growth and yield so that it can meet your goals today, but also 10, 20 years in the future? Because that is the dilemma. And I want to talk about that in today's video and towards the end of it, just as a kind of a teaser here to why you should watch this video towards the end of the video, the bottom of the article, I break down different time horizons and different mixes of if you were to invest in to DGRW and JEPQ. And I break down, you know, what that could look like. And so this is why this article is so interesting is mostly for that part. The article starts off by me saying that imagine for a moment that you spent the last 10 years of your life working towards retiring early. Now imagine all of the excitement that comes with the thought of retiring early only to realize that you may not have enough income today, let alone in 30 years. That's the dilemma, the income today, but also that it's growing in 10, 20, 30 years. The challenge of retiring early is knowing how and where to invest your money so that it works for you, not against you. We often look at how to invest as binary, meaning there's only a right and a wrong way. Without sounding too corny and to quote my mom from the 1980s, where there's a will, there's a way, right? Have you seen that little story, the, uh, the little engine that could? Chugga chugga, all right. <laughs> my theory is that by combining above market dividend growth 
with above market average yield, an early retiree can retire early without the fear of having to return to their nine to five job. So this is the dilemma, this is the use case that we're looking at. How do we approach this or how could we approach this? And there is an emphasis here on the monthly aspect of this, right? So I'm not just talking about the simple path to wealth with dividend investing. If you're a subscriber of the channel, you know this. I'm talking more focused on a monthly dividend. This would be more applicable, you know, for my wife. If you saw my video a couple weeks ago, I talked about how my goal for my wife's portfolio was to generate more of a monthly income so she didn't have to budget around a quarterly dividend. So we're not talking about SEHD and DGRO, DGRO in this case, we're talking about DGRW and JEPQ. Okay, so this right here, what I'm talking about, if you follow the simple path to wealth with dividend investing, this could potentially make up the satellite portion of your portfolio, right? We talk about the core and satellite portfolio a lot on my channel. If you're hearing this for the very first time, at the end of the video, I will have a, a video pop up that talks more about that. You can watch that video next. So first off, what we're gonna take a look at is we're gonna look at DGRW. DGRW is the Wisdom Tree Quality Dividend Growth Fund, and it is the most unique dividend ETF that I've ever seen, where other more talked about dividend growth ETFs like SHD, VIG, DGRO are backwards looking. This means that traditional dividend growth ETFs screen for historical data, whereas DGRW screens for future potential dividend growth based on factors like projected and future dividend growth. And DGRW pays a monthly dividend. It does have a little bit of a higher expense ratio. I don't mention that here in the article, I don't think, but uh, it does have a higher expense ratio, okay? And so the top 10 holdings of DGRW, you got Microsoft, Apple, Johnson & Johnson. This is kind of a vanilla uh, dividend ETF where there's no cover calls being written on it. It's pretty straightforward except for the index and how it, you know, the rules of the, the index itself. And so, um, and I, as I mentioned earlier, I wrote this article a few months back. So some of the, uh, the numbers here are not gonna be uh, you know, up to date to today, but they're just a few months old. So they're still relevant in my opinion. So if we take a look at this in the last 10 years, DGRW has increased its dividend by 348% since 2013. When comparing DGRW to SPY, the S&P 500 ETF, SPY has increased its dividend by 89% since 2013. To understand how impressive this really is, not even the Schwab you know, dividend equity ETF SCHD has come close to this with only increasing its dividend by 184% since 2013. So this is really, really impressive. Um, really quick on the taxes, one of the challenges of retiring early is not benefiting from the most tax advantage accounts like a Roth IRA, 401k, HSA, you know, that kind of stuff, especially if you're here in the US. This can present a challenge for those looking to retire early. Thankfully, the dividend income from DGRW is taxed 100% as a qualified dividend. This makes investing into DGRW in a taxable account very advantageous compared to other high yielding assets or dividend or you know dividend ETFs like REIT ETFs, cover call ETFs. So this is very, very cost uh, tax efficient. Um, the next thing here that I wanted to take a look at is the yield on cost. When it comes to dividend growth ETFs, investors should focus on yield on cost. The yield on cost is the starting yield an investor receives when first purchasing shares of a company or ETF you know, your initial tranche that you buy. And with life expectancies around the world projected to increase, investors looking to retire early should look for investments that will grow your yield on cost and not destroy it. This is absolutely fundamentally important, especially, you know, you may have heard the, uh, the whole yield trap. When an investment is not growing its dividend, this can be detrimental, especially as people are, are retiring and living longer, they need their investments to, you know, live longer with them. Now let's take a look at the next one here in JEPQ. The JP Morgan NASDAQ Equity Premium e Income ETF, JEPQ, is a cover call ETF that writes out of the money call options. It is very important investors understand the differences between out of the money and in or at the money call options. The derivative strategy of writing out of the money call options offers investors the opportunity to participate in capital appreciation while enjoying an above market average yield. 
and JebQ also pays a monthly dividend. Now, this is incredibly important, guys. If you're investing in the cover call ETFs, it is absolutely essential, in my opinion, if you're retiring early off of your dividend portfolio, that you focus, if you're gonna include you know, cover call ETFs, that they follow an out of the money call option strategy. Otherwise, your capital is gonna get eroded away and especially in a bull market, okay? And so this article, once again, is more tailored to those who are looking to retire early. So I'm assuming here that you have the money today and that you're not dollar cost averaging, you're not retiring in 10 or 20 years, but rather that you're retiring now and that you're living off of the portfolio. So if you have longer than five years before you plan on retiring, it would be in most cases, mathematically, and we're looking at historical data here, right? Historically, it would, been, it would have been much wiser to invest in the growth and then rebalance in to a cover call ETF like JEPQ. So once again, very important, the premise of this article is if you were retiring today, or if you're retiring early now um, and you had the money today, you would then look to invest into JEPQ versus dollar cost averaging into JEPQ for the next 10 or 20 years. Okay, so pretty important. If you didn't understand that, write a comment and I'll, I'll explain it in more detail in the comment section. But essentially that's that's an important piece that you wanna make sure that you, you understand. So despite being a new ETF on the market with an accept, inception date of May, 2022, the net inflows have been very impressive. All I'm highlighting here is that JEPQ is a newer ETF, but despite being new, it has very quickly been, uh, you know, kind of a fan favorite here um, in the market. So especially among cover call ETS. This is especially impressive when comparing the 2023 net asset inflows of JEPQ with the Global X NASDAQ 100 cover call ETF QYLD. When you compare QYLD with JEPQ, it's just night and day the difference of new money flowing into JEPQ. Now, this is what I was talking about earlier with out of, with out of the money call options where you have upside potential. JEPQ offers that upside potential where QYLD has not. And that's why when you look at the charts of QYLD and JEPQ and comparing them, you'll notice a pretty stark difference between the two. So it's important to understand, you know, how these ETFs function. The tax scheme of JEPQ is quite different from DGRW or other fully qualified or not or fully non-qualified dividend investments. Due to JEPQ writing a call option on the underlying shares, the investor will participate in receiving both the qualified dividend as well as the premium income from the equity linked note, otherwise known as the option premium. So you'll notice here on the graph that over the last 12 months, what's in orange has been the premium income. And what's been in blue, that's been the qualified income. So when you get your tax return, you get your 1099 dividend form, you'll see that the overwhelming majority of the income, the distribution will be considered a non-qualified dividend as represented here in orange, whereas the blue portion will be uh, considered a qualified dividend. So it's important to see that and it's all done automated, you know, automatic for you from your, you know, your brokerage, you'll get your 1099, you don't have to manually do that, it's pretty easy. So the income catalyst for JEPQ, the catalyst for higher premiums will be dependent on market volatility. The more volatility in the market, the higher the options premiums will be for JEPQ. It's important for investors to understand there may be periods of higher volatility which will cause option premiums to increase. Conversely, in periods of lower volatility, investors should in expect option premiums to decrease. So when there's less volatility, the premiums, you're not gonna get that. It all has to do with derivatives with op the options market, guys. So if you don't understand that, that's that's important that you understand that JEPQ, the upside is capped because they're writing call options on it. And by writing those call options, you're generating a premium and the premiums are directly impacted by the volatility in the market. So the higher the volatility, higher the VIX as an example, the more likely you're gonna see higher distributions. In lower volatility times, you're gonna see lower distributions. That's just how, how these cover call ETFs work. So however, despite the option premiums correlated to market volatility, the share price of JEPQ is fundamentally less volatile than the underlying index of the NASDAQ 100. I thought that this was really cool because dividend investors, we generally want to have a more you know, stress-free retirement. We wanna see generally less volatility. And so JEPQ 
Web Q is less volatile than just outright owning the NASDAQ through QQQ, for example. So here we get into the better together, DGRW plus JEPQ. So like peanut butter and jelly, the Wisdom Tree US Quality Dividend Growth uh, ETF, DGRW, and JEPQ go better together. So in order to project reasonably what future cash flows would look like, so meaning your cash flow, you, your dividends, we would need to base our assumptions off of past performance. It's important to remember that past performance is never a guarantee of future performance. However, to quote Mark Twain, history may not repeat itself, but it does rhyme. So this is where that grain of salt comes into play, guys. Think of that grain of salt. So let's take a look at this. Here, when we look, when I created this article a few months back, these were the metrics here. If you go on Seeking Alpha and you look at them today, they are different, okay? So this changes in real time. If the market were to dive 10% next week, or next month, all of this will, will shift, okay? So the assumptions here for the purpose of this video, I used a starting forward dividend yield of 1.9%. I think it's like 1.65 today, okay? And a dividend growth rate of 9.5%. Now, this is actually quite a bit lower today. If you were to use the 10-year it's actually over, I think over 10 or 12%. So I'm not gonna change it for the purpose of this video. When I wrote the article a few months ago, if it was relevant then, in my opinion, it's relevant now. You just kind of have to see, it, you know, if you're lump sum investing and retiring and doing an approach like this, you kind of just have to see, well, where the market's at, you know, at the moment where you're investing the money. So just take this with a big grain of salt. So next, let's take a look at JEPQ. JEPQ, I have here a 12% dividend yield. I think it's gone down slightly because the share price has gone up so much over these last couple of months. So once again, take this with a grain of salt. The five-year or the 10-year you know, dividend CAGR with JEPQ, we just don't have it. And so I was incredibly conservative with how I, I figured this. So this is kind of right here, this is kind of the disclaimer on how I came up with this number. JEPQ is only, has only one year of data to pull from. In order to make this a reasonable assumption, I compared the historical data with a similar cover call ETF with the uh, you know QYLD. However, given the fundamental differences between these two funds, I do not believe this is a comparable source due to the at the money versus out of the money investment strategy of QLD. Therefore, given the investment strategy of JEPQ writing out of the money options, one could reasonably assume a higher rate of return than QYLD, which has a negative 6% five-year dividend CAGR rate. Uh, dividend CAGR. So consequently, I selected a very conservative growth rate pairing with the long-term median U.S. inflation rate of 2%. This right here, you might ask to me how I got it. This is just a guess, guys. I, I don't know because I don't know how market volatility is going to be over the next, you know, in the future. So this is just merely a guess. And in my opinion, I think this is a pretty conservative guess considering how they write out of the money uh, options here. So because an early retiree is looking to live off of his or her port dividend portfolio, the charts below are not considering dividends reinvested or any additional invested capital. So now here in the article, I break down three different examples of how you could allocate a portfolio if you were retiring today, if you wanted to consider JEPQ and DGRW using the metrics ab above. So the weighted average dividend yield would be 6.96%. That is if you had 50% uh, into JEPQ and 50% into DGRW. And once again, for all those of you watching, this would be in the satellite per portion of your portfolio. So if you were just looking at your satellite as an example here, these are the metrics that you could consider. And then the weighted average five-year dividend growth rate, as we talked about above, this is, you know, this is going to vary on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. For the purpose of this video, I have it at 5.75%. So the table here below shows the dividend income that you could reasonably assume with the metrics above, if you were to invest a lump sum amount today of either $100,000, $500,000, or a million dollars, and over the different time periods. So after your first year of investing $100,000, you would generate just under $7,000. And then after 20 years, you would generate $20,000. And then with $500,000 in the first year, you generate just under $35,000. And then after 20 years, you generate just over $100,000. So this was coming back to the dilemma. How do you get income today 
while also getting a growing dividend over the next 20 years. And this is how the chart looks based off of the asset allocation of 50% JEPQ, 50% DGRW. And then if you were to invest a million dollars into this type of allocation, and if you were to invest the assumptions above, you generate just under $70,000 in your first year. And after 20 years, you generate just over $200,000. And this is once again, without the dividends reinvested. This is assuming that you're retiring off of your, your portfolio. And this is how you would have your portfolio allocated. And you can see that here in the, uh, the graph there. So that's the first example. The second example is if you were to allocate 70% into JEPQ and 30% into DGRW, you'd have a weighted average dividend yield of just under 9%. And you'd have a weighted average uh, five year or you know dividend growth rate of about 4%. And so the same with example one, if you invested $100,000 in your first year, you generate nine, just about $9,000 after 20 years, you generate about $20,000. With $500,000, you generate just under $45,000. And then in 20 years, you generate just under $100,000. And then with a million dollars, you generate just under $90,000. And in 20 years, just under $200,000. So what you'll notice in the first example, you would have just over $200,000. So with a higher allocation into JEPQ, you're getting that higher income up front, but on the tail end in 10, 20, 30, 40 years, you know, you're gonna have less and less income because you're skewed more towards yield or income today. And you'll see here in the chart that you know, you're getting more income up front, but that income is growing slower over time because it's allocated less to growth. Now, the third example is if you were to flip that upside down, have less in yield and more into growth, you'd have a weighted average dividend yield of about 5%, but you would have a much higher dividend growth rate of just over 7%. If you were to invest $100,000 in year one, you'd just get under 5,000. In 20 years, you get just under 19,000. If you were to invest 500,000, you get just under 25,000. In 20 years, you get just, uh, you know, just over 93,000. If you were to invest, you get just under 50,000 in the first year and just under, you know, 190, $186,000 in dividend income. And so what you'll notice with this one is you're getting a lower yield or lower income in the first year, but you have the potential to really outpace and grow. So this only goes to 20 years. You would assume and expect that if I had 30 years here, that this portfolio would outpace and outgrow all of them. But because we're looking at a 20 year time horizon here, they're all fairly similar. Okay. So remember, so this is option three. Uh, you're getting 180, about 187,000, uh, more focused on growth. With this one, more focused on income, you're getting more income even after 20 years. Do you follow me? Like, that's incredible. Even after 20 years, skewing more towards JEPQ in 20 years got you more income. So understanding time horizons, guys, is so, so important. And if you were to go 50-50, this is the most optimal if you want, um, you know, if your time horizon is a 20 year time horizon. So understanding the differences of what your income will look like in 10 years, 20 years, and 30 years, based off of how you allocate your portfolio and focusing on your weighted average dividend yield and your weighted average dividend growth rate. And based off of your time horizon, that will help you to decide okay, well, which one should I focus on? I'll give you an example. Um, if you're in your you know, 50s or in your 60s, you probably want to focus more so on a portfolio like this because you don't have 30, 40 years for it to grow. You need the income up front. However, if you're maybe in your 30s or in your maybe your early 40s, something like that, you maybe want to focus on something like this because you're going to see that growth on the tail end after you get into the 20 plus years. Okay, so that's how you understand this and how you look at this from how to invest based off of your investment time horizon. 
So continuing on with the article, the three examples above represent three unique investing time horizons. According to the socialsecurity.gov website, the normal retirement age is between 65 and 67. With that in mind, someone could be considered an early retiree at the age of 35 as well as 59. Okay, and so that's what I was talking about earlier. Depending on your, your time horizon, that's what dictates it. it does, your age not doesn't always necessarily dictate you know, everything. It's based off of when you plan on retiring and how do you, how do you look at that? So this is, I found was interesting as society progresses, as we get more innovation in medical, you know, medical care, people are living longer. And so according to the U S census bureau, life expectancy for the U S is projected to increase from 80 to 85 by 2060. As a result, someone looking to retire early in their 30s should lean more towards example three, whereas someone looking to retire in their 50s should lean more towards example one or two. So it's important to understand we are living longer. And this is the, this coming back to the dilemma, right? How do we get income today that's also going to grow and grow as we get older? So in conclusion, it's important investors understand the risks when skewing too heavily in favor of JEPQ due to the unpredictable nature of market volatility, which has a direct impact on the fund's ability to generate monthly income. Conversely, it's important for investors to understand the risks when skewing too heavily in favor of DGRW due to the low starting dividend yield, which will require disproportionately higher amounts of capital to generate monthly income. Combining growth with yield can be a balancing act many early retirees struggle to find. With DGRW and JEPQ, early, early retirees can rest well at night knowing their monthly dividend income will continue to grow in both good and bad economic times. The beautiful thing about combining these two ETFs is that investors can skew the weighting that fits his or her personal investment goals. Well, everybody, that was the article that I never ended up publishing. I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on, you know, what you think of it. The format of this video, is that something that was interesting? Was it boring? Was, I don't know. I, I It's hard for me to kind of gauge what people think without, you know, reading your comments or and seeing what you think. I will leave in the description of this video or the pinned comment of this video, a link to the dividend reinvestment calculator that I used for my projections. This is a, a calculator that I share for free. There's no paywall. You don't have to pay me anything. You can use it. The cool thing about this calculator, not only that it, is it free, but it distinguishes between capital appreciation and dividend growth. And so you can break them up separately and see you know, how your dividend income will grow over time. And there's different thing, different calculators here that you can see. One, this is the, you know, traditional dividend reinvestment if you're working your nine to five. This one right here is more applicable for today's video. You know, say for example, you have a million dollars, half a million dollars, a hundred thousand dollars, and you're retiring and you're looking to how to deploy that money, where to invest it. You can use a calculator like this today where you're no longer reinvesting the dividends and you're no longer adding to the portfolio. So your share count will not change and you can see how the portfolio will grow over time from just the dividends alone. And so this is the calculator that I used for the uh, the charts that I made in that article. So something that may be of use for you, maybe, maybe not. Um, you can see some other people are already using it. You got an anonymous goose. <laughs> What? I got an anonymous goose in here using it right now as I'm recording this video. And so if you do want to edit this, what you will have to do is go over here to file, go down to make a copy, and then you can save it for yourself and you can edit it for you. But yeah, I hope the video was helpful. If you do want to support the channel, you can check out my links in the description of the video and in the pinned comment. I don't sell anything. I don't have a Patreon. I have nothing to sell you, but I do generate some income from affiliates. If you do sign up using my link, I do benefit from it. So that's something that's important to me. I never wanted to take your money as a viewer of my channel. But if you wanted to support my channel, you can use my links to sign up to M1 or Seeking Alpha. That directly benefits me and um, greatly appreciate it. So hope that the video was valuable to you and I'll see everybody in next week's video. Please subscribe. 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 Please sub sub subscribe. Huh? You know what? I think we're gonna be friends. Can everyone say hi to my friend? That's crazy. I just wanted to say thanks.
I'm glad you came along, partner.